Hi, my name is Stuart Lynch and this is the final video of a nine-part series on understanding how to parse JSON using the Codable protocol in Swift and Swift UI. In this video, we'll explore a real application project instead of a playground and see a practical example of decoding JSON from a file that might be stored in either the application bundle or the app's documents folder. We'll learn how to encode and save any updates to the documents folder. If this is something you want to learn, then keep on watching. I offer a feature in most of my apps that allows my users to either encode and email their data so I can check it out if there's a bug or some other complication with their data, or I offer a backup and restore option. Sometimes I get them to backup to the documents folder in the app, and other times I use the Dropbox API and get them to backup and restore from there. In all cases, I use JSON. In this, the final video, I'm going to go through a very simple scenario how you can both decode and encode data in your app, even if you don't use an external API. For the purposes of this video, I've created two applications, one using UIKit and storyboards, and the other one Swift UI. They're both a slightly different implementation of the same thing. When the application opens, it checks first to see if the user has a backup of the list of books that he's been maintaining in the app. It checks first to see if the user has a backup of the list of books that he's maintaining in the app. If it doesn't find a backup, it sees the application with a single book. I can add books, and I can delete books. Whenever I make any change whatsoever, it creates a backup file in the Documents folder, and subsequent launches will no longer read the seed data, but rather restore from the backup. If we launch this app one more time, I no longer see the default seed book, but rather the book or books that my app had when I exited the last time. You can download the project files from the link in the notes below, I won't be covering any UIKit or SwiftUI code in the video other than to give you a quick overview of what's going on. In both cases, however, we'll be modifying a single service class that handles the work of retrieving and decoding and encoding and saving the data. It's all just Swift whether you're in SwiftUI or UIKit. Here are the key features. Many of the files are identical in both the SwiftUI and UIKit versions. After all, SwiftUI is basically for creating your interface, so instead of view controllers, we use views in a declarative framework. The first file in common is our model, the book item struct that is codable and for the purposes of SwiftUI identifiable. Next, we have the book item data source. This contains all of the functions that deal with our CRUD operations, create, read, update, and delete, from the book item array. In both this, the SwiftUI version and the UIKit version, there are calls to the service class storage functions that deal with the saving and retrieving the books from where the data is stored. The most important thing to note here is that when we create an instance of the book item data source, the initializer calls the storage functions retrieve books function that populates our books variable with an array of books that our application uses. It is here in the storage functions where we're going to have to do all of our work. The work is the same whether you are using UIKit or Swift UI. I basically have two empty functions right here that we'll be coding shortly. The first one will retrieve the books and return an array of book item, and the second accepts an array of book item and it will save it somewhere. If I switch to the UIKit version and look at the view controller, the initial view controller, I see that our instance of book item data source is created there. So our books array will be data source.books, and you can see a reference to that in the prepare for segue function. Switching back to Swift UI, we can see that we create our instance of book item data source in the scene delegate, and then pass it as an environment object up the chain of Swift UI views. 
Our array of books here then will be mybooks.books. From now on, I'm just going to work in the Swift UI project. But if you're using UIKit, the good news is that I would be doing exactly the same thing, absolutely no different. Let's take a closer look at the book item struct. It describes the book with an ID, a title, author, and notes. As I mentioned in the overview on first launch, it will see if there is a backup in the documents folder, and if not, will load seed data from the application bundle. Here's that bundle file, seed.json. As you can see, it's JSON, and it's an array with one object in it. The object's key maps to our book item struct that already conforms to the codable protocol. So back in storage functions, let's first define two static constants that are the URLs for the documents folder where we will be saving our backup and the application bundle where the seed data is. For our backup URL, we'll use file manager to get all of the URLs for the documents directory and pick the first one and append the name of our backup file, which is going to be backup.json. For the application bundle URL, we can use this, and it should be familiar to you as we covered this back in the third video. Now with the retrieve books function, let's assume that we have a backup, as that will always be the case after you make your first edit. So let's create a URL that is the same as our backup URL. And then we can change it if the backup doesn't exist to point to the bundle URL. This is easy because we can use the file exists method of file manager and pass in the path of our backup URL. So if it doesn't exist, we can use not file manager file exists at the path of our backup URL. And then we'll assign our bundle URL to the URL variable. With the location URL now decided, we can do our familiar dance and fetch and decode the JSON. We create our decoder. We try to get data from the URL and report and exit the app if you can't. So we'll use the guard statement and the try question mark. Then we try to decode the data as an array of book item. And again, report and exit the app if we can't. So another guard statement. And finally, instead of returning an empty array, if we got this far, we must have an array of book item, so we can return that instead. Moving now on to the store books function, this is a simple task of encoding the data that we get and writing it to the documents directory. So we'll create an encoder, and then we'll try to encode the data and report and exit the app if we fail. Nope, we're using the try question mark to make sure that we can decode the data and crash out and fail with the fatal error message. What we can do now is convert the data to a string using the UTF-8 encoding, because when we store this data in our documents folder, we just want to write the string to our backup file, which is referenced through the backup URL. So with the data converted to the string, we can try to write it back to the backup URL, which is in our documents directory, with the backup name backup.json. We do this using a do try catch block to catch any possible errors. So try bookjson.write to the backup URL atomically true with UTF-8 encoding. That's it. There's one more thing I should mention. I want to be able to check out my documents directory to see if that file actually gets created and changed as items are updated. To make this easy for me to find, I've added this print statement to the app delegates did finish launching function. 
Now each time the app launches, I'll see this path in the console. So let's run the app for the first time now. Notice that there is only one book in the list, and this is the one it got from the bundle. I see the path to the application documents folder in the console, so I'll copy it and go to the finder and type Command Shift G to bring up a dialog that asks me to enter the path to where I want to go. I'll paste our app documents path in here and press go. We see it's an empty folder. Let's go back to our app now and create a new book and save it. If I return to the finder, I now see a backup.json file in my apps documents folder. I'll open it in text edit and see that this new book has been added to the array in our JSON. Let's stop the app and run once more. It's now retrieving the backup directory and no longer getting the single book from the seed.json file. Let me delete this file and run again. We're back to our seed. And adding another book adds back our backup file. I'll leave it up to you now to research and find out how you can send an email with an attachment so that you can have your users send you data from your apps. But one more interesting thing that you can do is go to your info.plist and add these two rows. The first one is supports opening documents in place. And the second one is application supports iTunes file sharing. Change both of the values to yes. With these two items in place, we'll run the app one more time. Users who are logged into their iCloud account will be able to open the Files app and open On My Phone and see a Documents folder with your app name in there. If I open the folder, I see my backups.json file, and it can be open and shared from here as well. I'm just trying to provide you with some food for thought on how you might be able to use this feature. Well, that's it. You've come to the end of this series. I hope you've learned something that can help you on your path to becoming a developer. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. If the response I get is positive, I'll continue to produce more single videos and series like this throughout the year. I'm most active on Twitter, so follow me there to find out what else I'm up to.
I hope you've enjoyed this video and have learned something. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. That will encourage me to keep on creating more like this in an effort to help new and existing iOS developers hone their skills and move on to the next level. I am most active on Twitter, so be sure to follow me there and get all the latest news of what I'm up to.